This is the Mooks and the Gripes podcast. Hello, everybody. This is Trevor, and I am here. Fortunately, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Trevor. Yeah, it's great to be here. I like that one. And as, as I've said in previous episodes, now I always make sure I've had some coffee, so I'm ready for whatever you throw up. <laughs> I'm not doing a very good job. I, I, I don't do that nearly as much as I should. So. Nah. <laughs> All right. Keeps me, keeps me ready. Well, Paul, we are here today. It is the beginning of November. How are you doing as we enter into this magical time of year? Uh, I'm doing great. I love it. As we've talked about before, this is definitely my favorite part of the year. I love that it's cooling off and not that we ever need more excuses for time to read, but this does seem to lend itself to that. So Mm -hmm. yeah, loving everything about it. I'm always a big fan of the holidays. I'm looking forward to the next couple months as well. So yeah, how about you? Oh yeah, this is this is wonderful, and I've been looking forward to it maybe more than ever because in our books about books episode that we released a few weeks ago on October fourteenth, you brought up a book that talked about bookstores and visiting bookstores in November on a Tuesday. Mm-hmm. I picture it as a Tuesday afternoon. I can't remember right now if that's when it was. I think it was. <laughs> There's something about that image that just clicks. It's perfect. It's mm-hmm. it made me excited to go to a bookstore in, on a Tuesday in Tuesday afternoon in in November. I haven't done that quite yet, but I'm going to do it this year, or at yeah. least something similar. Because I don't know what is it about that phrase. I talked to my wife a little bit about it, and I have some ideas. But did that strike you like it struck me? Yeah, it really did. I think for the November part is obviously key because cooler weather. You know, you come in from a chilly day and you walk into a nice warm cozy bookstore I think that's part of it and for me I think Mm -hmm. maybe part of the Tuesday is it it feels a little bit not forbidden but it's like maybe it's a boring work day and it's this Uh little treat maybe you sneak off at lunch and you go to the bookstore maybe you 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 leave a little early or you take the day but I think there's something about the Tuesday part too it's not a, a Saturday it's a Tuesday. It's it's the time where you're getting this little extra secret time at mm-hmm. doing something you love. So that's kind of what I think about. Yeah, you're stealing time. And I don't mean stealing it from work, but it's not just part of the normal everyday busyness. You're making time to go to the bookstore on a Tuesday afternoon. I love how you en- you know enter from the outside where it's cold and get in there. It's a little bit warm mm-hmm. and there's a bunch of books welcoming you. We are going to be talking about bookstores today and I'm very excited. I love going to the bookstore. In fact, you and I both went to bookstores last night. Uh, yeah. Well, you went yesterday, mm-hmm. um, and I went yesterday in the evening, p- potentially a little bit inspired by your outing. I thought, well, if Paul's <laughs> going to the bookstore. That's right. I better go too. And my wife and I went and had a good time in, good. in our local used bookstore. I'm glad I was a good influence on you. Yes, I appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. I came yeah. home with a stack of Ellis Peters, Brother Cadfell novels. Uh, uh, I've been I've been wanting every time I go to the store. There's a few there. Sometimes they're so mangled, I just don't buy them. If they're too, you know, I can't. I'm about to talk about this maybe someday. I can't read a book that's that's torn apart already. I, I have a yeah. really hard time with that. It's not that I mind people doing that or mind other people reading it. I just I can't do it. Mm-hmm. And so I don't buy them. But last night they had. I mean, I basically almost finished my collection of those books. It's a big <laughs> so stack. I books. saw the picture. Yeah, and they looked like they were in really good condition. And yeah, you yep. had to be excited when you came across those. I was. the Like the whole thing. And when I took them down, the owner said, oh, these come in waves. Some years we don't get any. And other years we get a bunch. And it looks like you've just made the wave go back out. <laughs> <laughs> Single-handedly. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I took them, took them off their hands. Uh, but that was a lot of fun. And you, do, do you want to kind of talk a little bit about your special trip at all? I, sure. If you're going to save it for later, of course, I understand that. But I'm No, I'm I mean, curious. I can talk about it. Yeah, no. Um, Boulder Bookstore is, I, I may have mentioned it before. It's just one of my favorite places on earth. So, you know, we're down in Denver. So Boulder is about an hour away, maybe three or four times a year, either with the family or with friends or sometimes just by myself. I'll make the the trek up to Boulder and they have several really good bookstores, but the Boulder bookstore in particular is just wonderful. It's three stories of books and a good mix of new and used. They have lots of signed copies, all kinds of stuff. It's pretty much everything I could ever want in a bookstore. And so, yeah, I met a friend up there yesterday and we, you know, we both took the day off from work on a Friday and just went up there and goofed around and, um, you know, ate some good food and everything. And in particular, yesterday turned into a bit of an NYRB day for me. So I found... (laughs) 
Oh, all kinds. Some of them were used, which is always nice when they're in good shape. And then there was a couple of new ones as well that I came across. So yeah, I ended up with a stick, stack of six or seven books that are over there. You know, it's just such a exciting feeling. I don't know, no matter how many times I come across some little hidden gem, like I did yesterday, I still get that thrill, you know, especially something like we've talked about with certain publishers, you see that NYB RB cover on the, on the bookshelf or on the bookshelf at the store. And it's like this little thrill runs through you. Do I have that one? And Several times yesterday, I did not have it, so now I do. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, well, we'll we'll come back to bookstores. And so the, the the plan for today is talk about bookstores, talk about why we love them, some of our memories, maybe you know wherever the conversation goes, and then we'll end by talking about some of our favorite bookstores we've been to. But first, Paul, what have you been reading? Yeah, so I have been reading a kind of a steady stream of not difficult works, but as I said on Twitter, I think paragraph breaks have been few and far between in my reading these days. I've I read uh, some Krasna Horkai, and then I read um, what else? Some, you got a Bernhard uh, in there, right? Yeah, yeah. Bernhard. And so anyway, I decided after that little stretch, as much as I loved it, I would read something that was a little more not light necessarily. But I um, I don't know if you're familiar with Ann Tyler, but mm-hmm. um, yeah. I've read yeah several of her books over the years, and I always enjoy them. Like. I don't know how to say it because she's not like a favorite author, I wouldn't say necessarily. But every time that I'm just looking for something that's a good, solid read that I just know will be well done, it may not blow me away, but it's just something I'll enjoy. So anyway, I just started reading The Accidental Tourist by her. And so I'm not far into it, but it's basically the story of this guy named Malcolm Leary, who's a travel writer who basically hates to travel. He hates the adventure of it. He hates the unknown. He hates the surprise. And so he he does it, but kind of reluctantly. And, and on it seems like he kind of phones it in a little bit. But then as you read through the book, you start to realize there's more going on in his life. So he's recently split with his wife. And, and you start to realize why. This is not a spoiler. It's pretty early. Their son was tragically killed. And so you start to see maybe some of the reasons for his prickly personality evolve through the beginning of this book. And you know, just recently he's been trying to train this dog and he runs into this woman who is offering to help him train the dog. And I'm guessing that she's going to become a larger part of the story. I don't know where it's going to go yet, but yeah, so far it's what I would expect from Ann Tyler. It's, Mm -hmm. it's hooked me in and it's keeping me moving along. And, you know, she's a very talented writer. She really is. Yeah. Yeah. Every year when, when she's, well, ever since the booker opened themselves up to us writers, She's been on the list a couple times, I think. Mm-hmm. And there's always that argument of, oh, Ann Tyler, you know, she doesn't she just write these little domestic um, yeah. novels? And it's kind of like, well, to it to a, a degree, yeah, that's that's true. But boy, she's got a, a warmth to her. But it isn't it isn't just sentimental. I mean, she usually is dealing with tough uh, loss yeah. in her stories and and books. And I think she's 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 a treasure that. Many people have discovered, but it seems like many of us who consider ourselves, you know, well, I, I read serious literature, haven't discovered her uh, yeah. the way that we should. No, and I, and even like in my little intro there, I feel like I still to this day end up discounting her or poo-pooing her more than I mean to because there's no reason to. She's wonderful. And I don't know what it is that like, when, like I said, sometimes I'll just throw her in in between two other books I want to read and it's doing her a disservice because she's way more talented and her books are way, way better than that. So yeah. But anyway, it's, it's really good so far. I'm looking forward to finishing it up. Cool. I'm excited to hear your thoughts. Yeah. How about you? What are you reading? So I'm I'm a bit of a medieval junkie right now, I guess Hmm. it's not intentional, but a bit ago, NYRB classics came out with a new translation of Dante's Purgatorio, the Hmm. second of his, you know, divine comedy. It's by DM Black, a translator, that I, I don't I don't know his other work, but he certainly got good notes at the end of every chapter. And at the end of it, there's a nice essay about Purgatorio. And I have been enjoying that, that translation. I've never read Purgatorio before. I, I've read Inferno, I think even a couple times back in college, and then always have been tended to move on and read the rest of it. I don't know why I haven't. It's just one of those things, I guess, that I thought, I oh, maybe next year. Mm-hmm. But with this new translation, I jumped into it, and oh, I'm, it's so fun. It's so nice to be back into that world of considering the, the poetry of Dante, but also the theology, the culture, 
of medieval Italy and Europe and the, you know, all the different sins and things holding up these people from becoming holier beings and while they're working on it. I've just really been enjoying it. I'm I'm going to jump into Paradiso pretty quick afterwards, I think. I mean, I say that. Maybe it'll be 20 years from now. But Right. <laughs> I saw that, that they had come out with those two. So do they have all three, or is it just the two so far from NYRB? Just the two so far, and Inferno was actually several years ago. I don't have that edition, but I thought, well, maybe I should pick it up too and, and read it again, because it's been a long time. Mm-hmm. I read it in Robert Pinsky, his you know famous translation where he still does the Terza Rima. And I'd be interested in reading one that doesn't do that just to maybe see if see something different. Plus, it's just been so long. I, I could read any, any any of them and it'd be pretty new stuff to me. <laughs> right. No, I'm in the same boat with that one. I read Inferno back in college and it was probably just in a little, I don't know, almost like a mass paperback or dime. Like a signet. Dime. Yeah, probably a signet. And I mean, I do still have that copy. And then I think I have one of Paradiso too in that same or a similar edition. But yeah, when I saw those NYRBs, surprise, yeah. surprise, I was thinking, oh, <laughs> I better uh, track those down. So yeah. Oh, uh, they, they've put their imprimatur on Dante. He must be something. He, yeah, he exactly. must be worth reading. <laughs> Never heard of this guy. He's one of their undiscovered <laughs> gems. But no, but I mean, yeah, just more than anything, it would be another, not that I need an excuse, but I would like to, to dive back in and explore that world as well. So yeah, that's great. Well, and the other book that I picked up, it, it was actually, this is, is this considered slumming it? I don't know. I was at Costco mm. and they have their, their book selection there. I always go look at it because every once in a while there's something there that I'm like, yeah, I want to, I want to pick that up and read it. Mm-hmm. And they had a copy of Eric Jaeger's The Last Duel. It's a true story. I mean, it's a history book essentially about the last duel that, that the French parliament allowed uh, back in the late 1300s, between you know two people who were uh, ostensibly friends at one time or another, one of them, his wife accuses the other one of of raping her, and he denies it. I didn't. I didn't do that. And so you know, as we would do, you you and me, mm-hmm. it's best settled who's telling the truth. Well, by a fatal uh, co- a combat, you know. Of course, let's, of course. Let's let's figure this out. Whoever survives is clearly right, and whoever is, dies is. No, oh, they 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 were clearly wrong, right. and the weird kind of extra thing here is that if her husband dies, they will just uh, also say that she bore false witness and execute her on the spot. Oh, geez, wow! <laughs> I don't know how it turns out. I really don't know yet, and I, but I'm really liking the book because it's not just about the duel; it's about the culture, it's about the people and the time, and it's been it's been really fun. It's fairly short. But yeah, that that's where what I picked up at Costco. So between the two of those, I'm kind of steeped in in uh, that time period in in Europe, and mm-hmm. you know, I walk outside a little bit uh, a little bit worried about who might betray me, and <laughs> right, <laughs> you know, that's fun thinking though. about all my sins. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> see, you're not doing the light reading this week. <laughs> well, I don't know. The last duel is is also pretty light. It's kind of one of those. I mean, it's a history book, but it's, it's like 180 pages is all, okay. and it's pretty quick. It's one of those more, maybe, I don't know what you'd call it, but cozy history, perhaps mm-hmm. you can sit down and read a chapter and, and still get that little giddy feeling that you're, you know, reading a good, a good story. I don't think he's too held up by, I can only say what I know a hundred percent and have sourced, you know, I think right. he's, he's like, I'm going to tell a, a good story too, and make some leaps in in what I know for sure into what I can presume, you know, he even says that a little bit at the beginning where, where there's a gap, he's, he's, he's filled it in just a little bit. And I don't yeah. mind that as long as I, I know don't either. It, so yeah, exactly. If they disclose it at the beginning, I actually, I think sometimes it makes it more interesting when they do stuff like that. Yeah. So, but, but a lot of fun there. And I still haven't, I still, I haven't, I still haven't read Lauren Groff's matrix, which would take me a few hundred years earlier in to the, you know, medieval Europe but man, I can't wait to sit down and read that one. Uh, I know. I've, I've been savoring it. You know, it, it showed up and I'm like, well, I want to clear my head. I want to get these other things read first. And, you know, then I'm at Costco and the last duels there. And I'm like, oh, I'll pick that up. And that now. <laughs> you know, so it's just, just, just taking its time. But I, I'm going to stick with medieval Europe for a little while. <laughs> that's, no, that's fun. We talked about some of those kind of un, often unplanned uh, synchronicities in, in your reading life or something where all of a sudden things just kind of happen. And I like well, that. 
I I just realized it. I, I just brought a bunch of Brother Cadfell novels, and I did want to follow Francis's suggest, you know, her her example, I guess, and maybe pick up the next one of those and read it today. So, boy, I am really, really, you know, I'm leaving this time. No more That's modern right. stuff for me. <laughs> yeah, I'll be curious to see how you dress on the next podcast. <laughs> See if there's any fashion influences. I'll have a bunch of, you know, I'll, I'll just shave the, the top of my head and put on mm-hmm. some robes. <laughs> exactly. That's actually the most likely. I'm not going to become a knight. No. I, I'm, you know, I'll just become a, 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 a monk. So Yeah, some birds will be sitting on your shoulder. Or who yeah. knows, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Well, fun stuff. I'm excited to hear your Ann Tyler report. And I, I'll, I'll, of course, be talking a little bit about how these books keep striking me. Yeah, absolutely. Can't wait to hear Let's get back to bookstores then, because again, this is where so much of this fun starts and and why I can be, you know, excited to read one book and then in a bookstore, jump on something else. Yeah. There's just something about that promise. You know, you walk in, there's all these worlds just sitting there on a shelf waiting for you, inviting you. I know. No, exactly. So go ahead. Tell tell me a little bit, you know, let's get the conversation rolling. Okay. Um, I'm sure not everybody, you know, in the world has the sense that we do with bookstores, but I think they're magical places. And I think p- even people who don't frequent them as much as we do probably still sense that maybe a little bit, you know, many of them, something, something about them. Of course, not again, not everybody and they're not wrong, but I do think that these are pretty magical places. What, what, what do you think? What, what's your... Yeah. What's your no, I agree. Of? I mean, we talked, we touched on one of our previous episodes, the fantasy episode about early impressions of bookstores. So, you know, like we said, some of our first exposures were just in the mall. You know, maybe as a kid, mm-hmm. you were going there with your with your mom or dad, or you're going to the arcade or whatever, and all of a sudden you see all those books in the window and you get pulled in. So that was certainly one of my first exposures. But then we moved down to a part of Colorado in my middle school years that didn't have a mall. And so that was probably my first exposure to a bookstore that was more of an independent bookstore. There was this nice little, I think it was called the narrow gauge bookstore down in Alamosa. And it was just a little storefront on the main street there. And so, you know, that was probably my first exposure to something outside of like the, the big box or the mall type of a store. And I remember it was probably in eighth grade, we got to do like career day. And so they said, you know, reach out to a local business and see if you can go volunteer the, volunteer there for a day or two. And you can choose whatever mm-hmm. you want to. You can go work with your parents for a day. You can go, you know, work at the police station or whatever. And of course, me being me, I went straight to the narrow gauge bookstore and I was able to <laughs> work. And I put that in quotes uh, for, I think it was two days there. And I loved it. It was so fun. Just, you know, stocking the magazine racks and alphabetizing and all these different things. And then for my payment at the end, they gave me several books and the tragic part is they had to rip off the cover. I think that's something to do with the distribution or, or when they give it away. But I got, uh, I think it was several David Eddings books as payments for doing that. <laughs> so, you know, that was really fun too. That was one of my earlier bookstore memories. And that probably was like the spark for my ongoing dream to someday, you know, work in the back of a dusty bookstore, maybe in retirement or something. It's kind of funny. I had a similar, you know, project or invitation. I went to the library, <laughs> <laughs> and we still do that. You know, my we go to the library all the time. We will mm-hmm. do an episode. On, I know you do too. I again, there's just that magic of being able to browse and look at things. Mm-hmm. I want to. I want to read a little thing uh, from our good friend. You know, he doesn't know who we are, but he's become a part of our life. I think in some ways, Michael Durda. Mm-hmm. He he writes a lot about books and reading, and this is from his collection, Browsings, that came out a few years ago. And it's a segment that's called In Praise of Small Presses. So he gets to the small presses, but here's how he introduces it. And it's, I think it's timely, you know, holidays are coming up, but here we go. Mm -hmm. Books don't only furnish a room, they also make the best holiday gifts. Note that I said books... Kindles and Nooks and iPads may offer texts, but word pixels on a screen aren't books. Come Christmas morning, what do you tell your significant other? Darling, I can't thank you enough for this download of The Hobbit for my (laughs) e-reader. I don't think so. Somehow this isn't quite the same as unwrapping a signed first printing of The Hobbit in a fine dust jacket, many bucks, or Douglas Anderson's information-packed annotated edition, 
invaluable, or any of the handsome versions illustrated by Michael Haig or Alan Lee or Tolkien himself, or, you know, your nice 1980s, uh, exactly. you know, edition. I, <laughs> I, I've seen that one with Bilbo on the front, mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> like a middle-aged Bilbo. Mm-hmm. No, a Christmas present should be, well, something present right there in your hands after you've read the gift card and ripped aside the ribbons and bows and red and green paper decorated with snowmen and Santas. So hi thee to your nearest bookstore, be it an independent like Washington's Politics and Prose or a big box Barnes and Noble. What could be a better way to shop for the holidays than to spend an hour or two alone or with your family looking at books? In my own case, of course, I try to make it Christmas every day, or at least once a week. (laughs) (laughs) Now, I know he gets into some stuff about e-readers and books and all that, and and I think that's pertinent to our discussion. I I love reading e-books. It's so fun to take my Kindle places and download a new book immediately. That's its own pleasure. But yes, going to a bookstore and seeing the books sitting there on the shelves and flipping through them a little bit, pulling them off. There is something special about that, that, yeah, my kids who are incredibly technologically savvy and that's just the life they live, Mm -hmm. they do like going to the library and bookstores. They, you know, I took my, my second son to a bookstore around his birthday and one of the booksellers just took him in her hands and walked him around. And she was so excited about these books. And, oh, I love this series. And, and it wasn't fake. She wasn't selling mm-hmm. these books as just part of her job. She was selling them because she was sharing them and wanted him to feel that excitement. She was excited that he was excited. And so we walked away with the, with a book and, and other other things, you know, in the in the works for later on down the line. Mm-hmm. And yeah, he's still, I mean, it's cold outside now, but he's still, um, last night, it's almost dinner time. I'm in there cooking dinner and he, uh, all of a sudden I hear the, the doorbell ring thing because he's walked out and sitting on the porch reading a book. Oh, you know, he just, awesome. he, he loves, he loves doing that. So, um, and I think a lot of it is because we've always gone to bookstores. Yeah. You know, we took our kids to bookstores all their growing up. Now, yes, when they were really little. It was the Barnes and Noble and there were all the Thomas the oh, train, yeah. you know, <laughs> places and they'd go play on that while I would, you know, pick up a book or two and take it over there to, to browse. And those are special memories as, as weird and, you know, unbookish as they might be. It's still kind of wrapped up in all of that for us. My wife and I met in London and we would go to the bookstore a lot of mm-hmm. times to hang out and pick out books to share with one another or just our excitement there. So yeah, bookstores are bookstores are very special uh, to me, and I don't think they're going anywhere. I'll just you know that's maybe a different conversation, but yeah, I've been heartened that given everything that's gone on, there are still bookstores, and they still seem to be doing okay. Yeah, <laughs> I hope no, <anyway>. exactly. <laughs> no, I I agree. We're we're in the same boat with our family. Um, it's funny you mentioned that Thomas thing because that's we did the exact <laughs> same thing with both of our boys and. One thing that I liked about that is, yes, they're very focused on the trains, but A, they're around a bunch of books and it's just being, getting used to that. And then inevitably being toddlers, you know, they drop their train or they go over to the shelf and they see whatever, Richard Scarry or, Mm -hmm. you know, Eric Carl or whatever it is. And either it's one they recognize from home or one that gets their interest because they've never seen it before. And they bring it over to you and you get to read for a few pages before they go back to Thomas the train. So yeah, it's just that same thing. We've always um, had our kids there too. And there's a bookstore here in Denver that's called the Tattered Cover. And it's a great bookstore. And they have pre-COVID, they had a lot of nice squishy couches and things like that. And our kids Mm -hmm. still love to go get a cookie from the the bakery there and, you know, stick their feet up on the chair and, and just sit there and read through a stack of books. So yeah, I agree. It's, it's a magical thing. Um, And it's fun to see it getting instilled in your children and you always hope that's what happens, but you don't want to be you know, too pushy about it, but it's nice when it does work out the way you kind of hope and you start to see that love grow for them too. And it's fun to see how many of these independent bookstores were, were started by just people who loved books. Mm-hmm. I don't know how much that they knew going into it, the business side or whether that's even anything, but there are several authors who own bookstores. In fact, yeah. uh, we're going to talk about some of our favorite bookstores. I'm going to tell you a couple that I've never been to, but are definitely on my bucket list is mm-hmm. Birch Bark Books, which is Louise Erdrich's uh, bookstore. 
that she owns. And then there's Parnassus books uh, that Ann Patchett owns. Yeah. I've heard great things about these bookstores. A few of the ones I'll talk about later on were just started by book lovers or even people who were like, hey, we want to we want a place where we can also write our books. Mm-hmm. And so they started some of these bookstores. Where is the the Birch Bark? Do you remember? It is in Minneapolis. Mm. So it's not too close to me. Neither's Nashville. <laughs> right. You know, well, I've actually been you're at fortunate least on the enough. other side of the mountain range, you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, for work, there's been a lot of conferences in Nashville for whatever reason the last few years. And so I've actually been lucky enough to go to Parnassus several times. And yeah, you should definitely make the trek there when you can. It's it's a mm. gorgeous bookstore. And if I remember right, the story behind that was that there was basically a big gap around Nashville, surprisingly, where Ann Patchett realized people just don't have access to bookstores. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, that might even include the Barnes and Nobles. I think there was like maybe hmm. one Barnes and Noble or something like that. And and I may not have all the details right, but I know that her reason for starting, one of her reasons for starting that was basically to fill this need because she knew how valuable bookstores were. And she wanted to kind of make sure that the residents of Nashville had a place to go, which I love that. Yes, and uh, by the way, I just went to Birch Bark Books uh, homepage, and front and center, uh, Louise Erdrich's "The Sentence," which comes out. It, in fact, let's see, it comes out. It might be out by the time this episode mm. goes live, uh, November ninth. Yes, yes. So there's a new Louise Erdrich book. Ooh, that's exciting! So exciting! I love her. Love her stuff. Yeah, there, there, there's there's just something special about them. And the, and again, those Tuesday afternoons where you, you get a chance to go in there and kind of, you know, it's almost part of the escape uh, of all of these different things. And it can be an escape to talk or to think about things that are serious, you know, mm-hmm. things that are that are more important, you know, in the long run than whatever, you know, mundane task we might have, uh, whatever errands we might be running or the escape for something fun that's there you know going over to the fantasy section and looking at some of those books mm-hmm. it, th- all of those promises all of that excitement it's very hard to walk away with just one book <laughs> it is well i wanted to ask you like i think different people like different things about bookstores and there's no right answer to this and it may, might even change but for you like what are some of the things that make a great bookstore hmm okay I like being able to see things I've never seen before. And that's, a, you know, a, 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 t- a tall order. I guess what I mean, I do love going into Barnes & Noble. But I already know what's going to be front and center there because it's all over online too. You know, yeah. it's it's and it's fine. Those are great books. But I love going into bookstores that might be highlighting a backlist of some author. Those just really excite me. Or they have a section devoted to a publisher like Archipelago yeah. that you just see the beauty of these books in in context of, of something different from this is the newest bestseller or even this is the author's place in the alphabet. And right. I love seeing curation of that of that order. And I also love seeing a little bit of a of a messiness like there's it's over. This is an abundance of riches. Yeah. You'll have to search and you might miss something special, but that's just the way it is. You know, that's <laughs> just the way that it is. So I love all that kind of stuff. I love the warmth of them. Um, so I do like bookstores where I go in and I feel a little bit cozy. Yeah. And that's probably why November, like you said at the beginning is, is just a wonderful time for bookstores. And I don't mind if they have a refreshment section, but I do like walking around with a drink or something like that in my hand yeah. too. But that's not a, a necessity by any means. So yeah, I mean, I can go into the smallest bookstores, which there's one pretty close to my work that I wouldn't even, I don't even know what it's called. Actually, it's an antique store as well, but they have just a little section devoted to books and they have a lot of those NYRB children's collection Mm. books just sitting over there. And I love going over there and, and just looking through those and seeing, you know, something different again. These yeah. some of these books are, you know, new because they were just published by this particular publisher, but they're old because they're republishing something from 50 years ago. And so yeah, there's just that sense of discovery. I want something that 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 excites me in in that in that way in my dream bookstores, you know. Again, I'll mm-hmm. go into Barnes and Noble and still get excited and giddy and and have fun looking at books that I've seen 
you know, thousands of times when I'm going through their shells. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, but there's still the sense of, I haven't read them all. And what might catch my interest today? What am I, what, what's exciting me today? There's, mm-hmm. there's that, but yeah, definitely, definitely along the sense of discovery. How about, how about you? What are you? Yeah. What are you I, like? I mean, I, I agree with a lot of what you were saying. I think you said the word curation and to me that is one of the things in certain bookstores that can blow me away. It can be the tiniest bookstore. There's a, a bookstore up in Aspen, Colorado, that's in an old Victorian house. And it's a couple rooms and it's not a very big bookstore at all. But I remember going in there and I was just blown away by whoever that book buyer was. It was like they knew my taste exactly. And it's amazing when that kind of matches up with something like that, where you just every every time you turn around, you're like, oh, man, I can't believe that's actually here. You know, it's like mm-hmm. you might expect to only see it on Amazon or something, because to you, it seems like it's fairly obscure and, and it's just sitting right there in front of you. So I think curation can be a big part of it. I think a lot of times a lot of the independent bookstores have very knowledgeable staffs. And so, um, you know, those shelf talkers like recommended shelves mm-hmm. from certain at certain bookstores where, I mean, some of them, not, you know, anything like that is, is welcomed, but certain ones, you can tell that this staff just knows what they're talking about. They have really eclectic taste. It's not always like they're trying to push the new bestseller. It might be a backlisted book or something that you've never even heard of. And I really like those aspects of bookstores. And then I think there's something to be said too, for just another aspect of coziness, like having lots of places, little hidden corners and nooks, with Mm -hmm. a chair or a couch or something where you can kind of squirrel yourself away out of people's way and just have your stack of books and kind of spend some time just digging through those. So, you know, that's one thing that I've really missed through the last year and a half is even a lot of the bookstores that are open, you know, for obvious reasons, they they've had to kind of adjust that a little bit, but I'm really looking forward to a time when they can move that back in and you can just kind of find a place to, to settle in for a good hour and, and read through your books. So yeah, those are a few of the things I like. Paul, the holidays are coming up. In a, in a couple of weeks, we're going to release an episode about our plans for holiday reading, and I'm excited about that. But back in episode 11, a few weeks ago, we promised one lucky listener a fantastic gift that'll give all year round. <laughs> and it's time to announce the winner of our NYRB Classics Book Club giveaway. Uh, and it's been a lot of fun over the last couple of weeks to get emails from a lot of people uh, expressing their uh, love of NYRB classics that's similar to ours and sharing their favorite books with us. Some people just gave it in, to us in a list form. You know, here's my one, two, and three. And others, uh, and I really liked this, though of course it was not a requirement, but others did give us some details about the books that they like or, sh- or you know, did a little more in their email to communicate with us. And we really appreciated that. I'd love to share them all. But I, I just want everybody to know, thanks for your entries. Thanks for your kind words. Uh, we are going to share a few of them. But have, have you been enjoying that process, Paul? I've been sending them on to you so you have a chance yeah. to read them too. Oh, I've been loving it. I'm, I'm really excited about today and I can't wait to see who wins. But I'm also a little sad because I know that this is not going to be coming. I, I've just enjoyed <laughs> so much hearing people's choices. Like you said, a lot of their explanations, all the kind words they've said about the podcast. It's just been a lot of fun to get to know some of our readers a little bit better. And just like you and I do to each other, I've been adding a bunch of other books to my <laughs> list. So the, the readers have been bad slash good influences as well. So. Yeah. And, and I, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, this is the end. We're not going to get those emails anymore unless people just want to send them. Which yeah. I, we will welcome. We'd love to hear your feedback and we'll find times in the shows sometimes to be able to share it. But that's what we're going to do now for just a few minutes before we draw a winner we want to share some of the emails that we received because they were just fun. And I think that if you liked that episode, you'll allow us this little diversion, you know, this indulgence. We all, you know, it's it's something I think we all look forward to. But the first one I'm going to read is from someone who entered just yesterday. Turns out uh, she was not the last entrant. I did get one when I woke up this morning. So good oh, luck. <laughs> everybody beat the buzzer. <laughs> and uh, this is someone who may have been influenced a little bit by our NYRB Classics episode to dig in a little deeper into their catalog. Um, here's what Beth said. 
Thanks for this amazing giveaway. I think I came across NYRB a while back when searching for a copy of A Time of Gift. That's uh, Patrick Lee Fermer's book, uh, which I adore. And Stoner, that's John Williams. I'm, I'm adding a little bit for our listeners there, though we might not always know. <laughs> right. Um, that was always popping up on suggested reading lists, but I'm actually just getting started on the reading after hearing your lovely classic titles episode. I absolutely loved Stoner, and Butcher's Crossing is on my TBR. The Lonely Passion of Judith Hearn arrived in the mail yesterday. Paul, that's your bad influence, or good influence, I mean. (laughs) Uh, Looking forward to a reading weekend. On the forthcoming list, I'm excited for Hannah Arendt's Rachel Varnhagen, The Life of a Jewish Woman. Really enjoying your podcast and can't wait for the next episode, Beth. So, Beth, we are so glad we played a minor role in your NYRB Classics journey, uh, even if you were already taking the first steps. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Well, here's another one we got from our good friend Jackie, and her three books that she listed are Skylark by Deshu Kostolani. And this, she says, this may well have been the first NYRB edition I bought some nine or ten years ago, but it remains a favorite. The sort of book where nothing seems to happen, and yet everything happens. I love the combination of comedy, poignancy, and humanity in this one. She says, I really ought to reread it at some point. Her next book is Cassandra at the Wedding by Dorothy Baker. She says, I bought this after reading a terrific review of it in one of the broadsheets, Nick Lazard and the Guardian, I think, and it totally lived up to expectations. It's now one of my all-time favorite books, partly because Cassandra is such a complex and contradictory character, charming and witty one minute, domineering and manipulative the next. And yet she always seems true to herself and completely relatable. And then her third book is My Face for the World to See by Alfred Hayes. She says, I love this book. The sadness and darkness of the narrative, the coolness and precision of the style, the way it exposes the emptiness of the Hollywood dream is both masterful and heartbreaking. As for forthcoming releases, the one I'm most looking forward to is Woman Running in the Mountains by Yuko Tsushima. She writes so well about the loneliness and isolation of motherhood particularly single motherhood, in a country where this situation is frowned upon, or certainly was at the time when she was writing. Territory of Light is my favorite of the three I've read so far, but they've all been captivating and compelling. Best, Jackie. Thanks, Jackie. Those are great choices. Those are great choices. And here's a nice message from Marina. Hi, Paul and Trevor. I recently found your podcast on YouTube. There's only like a few listeners who catch it there. So thanks. I'm glad you found it there (laughs) from your NYRB episode. I really enjoyed the episode and I'm looking forward to listening to your back list. And we hope you enjoy it, Marina. By the way, I agree with Trevor regarding Trollope's The Warden. It's wonderful, especially the scene in London when Mr. Harding was hiding away in that quiet room trying to avoid the Archdeacon. I haven't finished the series yet, but I read The Warden twice. It's great. I would like to enter the NYRB giveaway. I've seen the NYRB classics around for a while, but only started reading from their catalog in the last couple of years or so. I am currently reading Grossman's Stalingrad and have a small stack on my shelves, which I still need to read. My favorites so far have been Sand by Wolfgang Herndorf, uh, such a wonderfully strange book, Equal Danger by Leonardo Sasha, and The Door by Magda Zabo. Some of the upcoming titles I'm interested in are The Silentiary by Antonio Di Benedetto, Memoirs from Beyond the Grave by Chateaubriand, sounds, sounds fun, and Written on Water by Eileen Chang. Thank you for doing the giveaway. Take care, Marina. The next one is from Christian, and we love that he told us a little bit about why he made all of his different choices. So he says, top three is impossible, but I'll try. The Go-Between by L.P. Hartley. The subtlety is absolutely stunning in this one. Hartley captures the innocence of childhood thrown right up against some deeply sad realities. It works as a story. It works on a prose level. It works philosophically too. Beautifully heartbreaking. And I'll just add my little editorial comment that I completely agree. I love that book so much. Mm -hmm. During the Reign of the Queen of Persia by Joan Chase. This book is the only thing I've read that I can compare with Alice Munro. It's a novel, but structured like complex stories. Like Munro, Chase makes sentences, details, and gestures communicate entire lives to the readers. And the third one, A Month in the Country by J.L. Carr. There's so much I could say about why I love this, but I'll just say it's one of those perfect short novels. Under 200 pages, but feels like an epic. There are so many levels going on here about art, World War I, religion, romance, and it all happens at once. Carr makes every word count. 
He says, I could list 20 books and want to add more, so I'll force myself to stop here. (laughs) We know how that goes. Yep. (laughs) And then his forthcoming, he says, it's funny you mentioned Mrs. Palfrey at the Claremont because I know for a fact I will buy it, even though I already own it, with with an unfortunately unattractive cover. And the two of Diana at Hill look absolutely right up my alley. I really enjoy the podcast and follow you, following you on Instagram. Keep up the good work, Christian. Thanks, Christian. And Christian isn't the only one who already owns Mrs. Palfrey at the Claremont, and yet we'll pick it up again. I'm in the same boat. <laughs> but so is Ruth, who writes, I will also avail myself of the lucky second entry to improve my chances by telling you what books I would love to get from the NYRB's upcoming releases. On one hand, I would like to treat myself to that copy of Mrs. Palfrey at the Claremont to replace the rather beat-up version I have now. (laughs) But if I were to challenge myself to get something new to me, I would pick up Seduced by Story by Peter Brook. It sounds fascinating and also something I would normally not read since I tend to read mostly fiction. Thanks again, sincerely, Ruth. This one says, Dear Mooks and Gripes, thank you so much for running this competition and for your podcast in general. I love nothing more than a warm discussion of books read and enjoyed. Well, thank you very much. Yes, that's just what we want to be doing, actually. Yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> I've read maybe 14 or 15 NYRB classics, and as you suggest in your dedicated episode, it's very hard to choose between them when the editorial standard is so high. But here are three titles that have stuck with me since reading. First one is Red Shift by Alan Garner. I heard about the book on Backlisted some years ago, then found the distinctive NYRB cover face-out in a second-hand bookstore somewhere near San Diego soon after. I must have read the book five times now. It might even be my favorite book, no qualification. I won't bore you with a blurb if you haven't read it. I can only say that I recommend it and Garner in general in the highest possible terms. That's one I keep seeing come up, by the way, and I, I got to check that one out. I've never read it. So. <laughs> I read it earlier this year, and it is bizarre. Yeah. But it is really good. The second choice from Sam is Motoran by David R. Bunch. I was sold on this one purely by the cover design. Mm. I knew nothing about it, bought it, and started reading it to find that Bunch's language in these dystopian stories is bonkers and brilliant. There's a quote, Ah, Motoran, land where leaves do not drop, land of the plasto-coated land, sweet, sweet, my shard hard home, unquote. That does sound crazy, too. (laughs) Um, Number three, Once and Forever by Kenji Miyazawa. Once again, I'm a sucker for a beautiful book, and to my thinking, there are none more beautiful from NYRB than this one. The stories inside are so gloriously imaginative. Judge Wildcat and his pints of quarreling acorns, or the bears of Namitoko who refuse to run from the hunter. They all find that it's sheer hubris to ever think oneself more than a mere subject of nature. says, and having taken a look through the upcoming titles, I'm most excited by Eileen Chang's Written on Water. I've never felt I had a very good grasp of Chinese culture, and this collection sounds like a very good way in for a novice like me. Thanks once again for all the wonderful work you're doing with my with the podcast. I always smile to see a new episode in my feed. Kind regards, Sam. Thank you, uh, Sam. We really appreciate that. Mm-hmm. And Paul, I love how the next one starts. It's like with a sigh of resignation at the task <laughs> that we set for everybody. Uh, kind of reminds me of a of a Krzyzynowski character who gets up every morning, <laughs> goes and stands against the wall, and stands with an attitude of utter resignation. <laughs> right, I know. The trials so, we put people through. Yes, it just says, okay, <laughs> A Time of Gifts by Patrick Lee Fermer. Fermer's story is well known, and it's all owing to his extraordinary memoir, of which this is the first. A dimension of the tale that I don't think is well enough noted is his reference to walking through a landscape just before the echo of an historical catastrophe. In this Western Europe section, Nazism is recapitulating the ways of the Reformation, while in the second volume, it's the Russian domination that, and destruction of highly cultured Eastern Europe with its echoes of the Mongol hordes. More than anything, though, it's a spectacular old man's take on when he and the world were young together. I really think that's really nicely put. I do too. Um, I love that. That was one of my very first podcasts I recorded with my brother mm-hmm. back in 2012. And yeah, I just such it's one of those books I held reverence toward for, for what it means to me. Um, very nicely put, uh, then the next one, the merchant of Prato by Iris Origo. 
This is an extraordinary recounting of a man emerging from the Black Death to succeed as a goods trader, thanks to an information network he develops across Europe. For 40 years, he sleeps five hours a night writing letters and amassing knowledge of prices and needs. We know so much because in 1870, workers found under a staircase his 500 ledgers and over 150,000 letters. This, er, the tale is wonderfully told by Rigo, an Englishwoman who married an Italian royalty and hid par- partisans during the war. Her memoirs, also published by NYRB, are fascinating. And, you know, I, I, I say Edis because I first uh, heard her name uh, watching a YouTube video that was in Italian. Oh, okay. <laughs> and they always called her Edis. But, uh, but yeah, she is an English woman, so I'm sure yeah, she I've went never by even, Iris, usually. Probably. But. I've never even heard of that one. That one sounds fascinating. And then the next one here, Rock, Paper, Scissors by Maxim Osipov. Warm and moving stories of life in contemporary Russia by a doctor who lived through the collapse of communism. The kind of thing you find from no other publisher. It was completely unknown to me and shook me. The thing I'm looking forward to most in the catalog. Oh, did you have to? (laughs) I'll go with Three Rings by Daniel Mendelssohn. I'm sure I'll love it, but I'm also glad that in addition to recovering astonishing literature, NYRB is publishing great living writers. Thanks, Quentin. So this next one is from Jason. Hi, guys. Well, this is exciting and challenging. How on earth am I supposed to pick three NYRB titles? Thankfully, there's at least one no-brainer. Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy. It's the single greatest book written in the English language and just an absolute pure joy being absorbed into. I've told my wife if I'm ever in the hospital for some terrible reason, just bring me the anatomy. I'm in a coma? Doesn't matter. Have it there ready because what if I wake up? (laughs) (laughs) Next up is one I reread every year without fail. Stifter's Rock Crystal. I haven't yet gotten a copy of Motley Stones, but I've lived with Stifter's work for a long while now. I'm not sentimental or particularly invested in the Christmas holidays, but one of my very few rituals is reading Rock Crystal every December. It's an absolutely perfect work that has only become more enchanting and more disconcerting since I've had my own child. The third one is nearly impossible to choose. There are so many, but I have to choose. So, Mutis's The Adventures and Misadventures of Mackerel. This is probably the book whose characters I think most fondly of as old friends, which seems like a good reason to select it. Although Gazina and Marie Crespal are high on that list too. By the way, that's from uh, uh, Uva Johnson's uh, Anniversaries, the Gazina and Marie Crespal. Oh. Ugh, he's right. But, yeah. Uh, anyway, sorry. That's another Go one. ahead. No, that's great. <laughs> great adventures, terrible sadness, genuine elation, and lots of laughs. Both a delightful romp and a deeply affecting meditation on, well, friendships, romances, and hopeless pursuits. Bonus. As for an upcoming title, I'm very committed to German and Austrian lit- literature lately and read Hemito von Dor- Dorer's The Demons last year. So The Struldhof Steps is the book I'm most looking forward to at the moment. Spending more time with those characters will be such a treat. Also, about a decade ago, I sent some pestering suggestions to NYRB to reprint Salton's Bambi, and I'm extremely pleased it's finally happening. In a Damien Searles translation, no less. Thanks, Jason. Oh, Paul, I'm glad listeners found this as difficult as we did. It's kind of nice to see some agonizing in Mm -hmm. these. Uh, (laughs) Here's another uh, list that expresses a bit of, I'll call it healthy frustration, (laughs) at the task that he calls borderline impossible. It says, hi, Trevor and Paul. First of all, thanks so much for your brilliant podcast. Well, thanks, Rick. I, brilliant. I don't know, but uh, we're, we're, we're working at it. <laughs> we're having fun. Um, I'd been looking for a book podcast to complement my backlisted fixation for a while, and I finally came across yours. I've really enjoyed every episode and have already taken up far too many of your recommendations for the health of my bank balance. It turns out that picking my favorite three NYRB classics is borderline impossible, but here goes. Stoner by John Williams. A Month in the Country by J.L. Carr, and Life and Fate by Vasily Grossman. Honorable Mentions, I don't know if this is permissible, Rick, but uh, Honorable Mentions, (laughs) Beware of Pity by Stefan Zweig, The Enchanted April by Elizabeth von Arnhem, and then the forthcoming one, Mrs. Palfrey at the Claremont by Elizabeth Taylor. As for the forthcoming ones I'm most excited about, Living Pictures by Polina Barskova sounds amazing. I loved The Siege by Helen Dunmore, so I'm very interested in reading another novel on The Siege of Leningrad, and this one looks fantastic. I'm also, speaking of Bambi, weirdly intrigued by Bambi by Felix Salton. 
It's such a well-known part of Anglo-American culture, but I didn't even know that it was a book. I'm hoping it'll be as captivating a fable as The White Umbrella by Brian Sewell, which is a wonderful story of a man rescuing a baby donkey in Peshawar and then having to try and get home overland to the UK with it. Do you see how I cleverly sneaked a few book recommendations into this email? Yes, we did. <laughs> Hope it constitutes a modicum of payback for all of yours. Now, I don't know. Does he mean payback or is it like a little bit of payback? You know, thing? <laughs> I'll, I'll choose the latter. I'll, yeah. I'll choose to think he's being kind. <laughs> Thanks again. Keep up the good work. Cheers, Rick. So here's one from Australia. Firstly, it's been amazing discovering your podcast in recent times. As an Australian, we've pretty much only known lockdowns for the past 18 months which, if nothing else, has helped me plunge back into the world of fiction and increasingly into literary podcasts. And I've just adored yours for so many reasons, but largely because of the peacefulness and egalitarianism you guys project and which contains nothing of the gatekeeping that usually turns me off certain aspects of literary appreciation. I was also so excited to see this NYRB Classics pod appear in my feed and equally enthused to hear about the competition therein. I was in second year uni 20 years ago at an off-off-off-Broadway university in suburban Melbourne and had just returned from Spain, miserable, with a broken heart and with the knowledge I knew so very little about the world beyond me. At this point, I wasn't even the slightest bit interested in fiction. That year, I took a European studies class and our incredible lecturer introduced us to the likes of Svevo, Moravia, and Shasha, whom we discovered via these NYRB classic editions, and which at the time didn't mean much at all from a publishing perspective but has since become my definitive go-to when it comes to seeking out first-class literature. And I do because the catalogs are so brilliantly curated and harness such integrity and spirit for both the world and for books. I always look back fondly on this university course for genuinely changing the direction of my life, while I associate NYRB Classics with that major pivot, which quite simply ripped the world open for me. On the pod, you asked about what listeners might be interested in from the new catalog, and the two names that jumped out to me were Antonio Di Benedetto and Vladimir Sorokin. I've read neither of these authors, but both appeal to me. I lived and worked in southern Chile for a while, and all things art over the Andes there in Argentina called out to me. As for Sorokin, he's a name that always jumps out, and whom people tend to agree is a contemporary genius. Thanks again for this pod of yours and for sharing your love of books. It's a world I'm so happy to have returned to over the last couple of years. All the way from Wollongong, James. Well, thank you so much, James. That was an amazing one. I love that one. Yeah, thank, thanks for the kind words. And um, I'm glad we could also spread some of that kind flattery to NYRB Classics too, yeah. you know, the inspiration for it all. But really do appreciate your your feedback on, on the podcast and how we try to talk to each other. Um, very much appreciated. All right, one more. And this one is right in line with today's podcast topic, too, about bookstores. Here's an entry from Nathan from Los Angeles, who used to work at a bookstore. And I wanted to share that part of his email. He says, years ago, I was a bookstore worker. And what I would always say about NYRB Classics is that if the book sounds like something that you might be interested in, you'll really like it. (laughs) They find great books. 100% 100% agree, James, and yep. glad that uh, uh, you could just uh, just rely on that to get customers right where they need to go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, Paul, one last thing before we announce the winner. We asked our listeners to do something that we ourselves did not do in that episode, and that was look at the list of forthcoming titles and choose the one you're most looking forward to. Are you willing to do a little bit more hard work and let <sighs> me know what your choice yeah, is? <laughs> I guess so. You know, I mean, it's such a big... Uh... You know, such a such an ask, but I'm willing to take that plunge. So I am going to follow up with, I think this is a, a popular choice, but I love Elizabeth Taylor so much. I read Angel a few years ago, and it's one of my very favorite NYRB classics that I've read so far. So I actually do not own any ratty old copies of Mrs. Palfrey at the Claremont. So I will be getting... I'll, I'll send you mine. <laughs> That's right. You can upcycle it. No, I mean, yeah, I'm just really excited about this one. Hearing people say that it might be her best. And the fact that I loved Angel as much as I did, you know, I'm pretty enthusiastic about giving this one a whirl. Plus, it's such a cool cover. It stands out from some of their other ones. It's kind of a line drawing that's very simple, but it has mm-hmm. bright blue and yellow. It's a gorgeous cover. So, yeah, that would probably be the one that would top my list. How about awesome. you? Awesome. Um, okay, I'll share mine too. Um, a few years ago, well, boy, back when Brian and I were doing the podcast, so nearly a decade ago, Antonio Di Benedetto's Zama was in the pipeline for years. It would show up as being published, like, let's say, next August. 
and then it would move to October and then February and then August. And then, you know, I don't know how long it did that, but when it finally arrived, it was amazing. I loved Zama. And then now they're releasing the silentiary, which is a uh, kind of a, a follow-up to Zama. Not like a, I don't think I don't, I haven't read it yet, but I don't think it's like a direct sequel or anything like that. It's just more part of a thematic trilogy of books. I think called the isolation trilogy by De Benedetto. And it's even shorter than Zama. So <laughs> there's that too, yeah. but I am very excited about the silentiary. Yeah. That's and, a great choice. Yeah. Oh, and you good choice on yours too. Speaking of Elizabeth Taylor, um, maybe we should let some of our old mascots go and move her up to being a, a mascot and start doing some more uh, work on her and do a podcast on her sometime. Would, I think we should. Yeah. Um, Cause my, like I said, in my limited exposure so far, I love everything she's read and, <laughs> and she is just raved about by so many people. All right. Well, Paul, I am going to reach into the brimming hat. I'm really happy about the, 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 um, the entries and most people did avail themselves of the, second uh, name in the hat not everybody though um but there were there were a few so i'm gonna do a random random number on my phone okay all right paul we have a winner do you mind doing the honors of naming the winner it's actually somebody that we we reread one of their their emails from oh Um, i'm happy to do it drum roll and the winner is quentin hardy congratulations quentin congratulations quentin I do have your email, so I will email and let you know that you've won. But I do not have an address where you would like us to send these NYRB classics over the next year. It won't be us doing it. You'll get the you'll get the special one Paul talked about. You know the Manila envelope, and uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> so. Uh, but congratulations, Quentin, and thanks everybody again. I hope that you'll continue to communicate with us, share some of your thoughts and feedback. And we do plan on doing a lot more fun giveaways, though. This one may may take the cake for yeah. some time to come. But it's going to be hard to match. But we have <laughs> lots of other fun stuff that we've talked about doing, and we're going to keep you know trying to do everything we can to make it fun. And and like Trevor said, we've had so much fun just hearing from all of you. So at any time, you know, if you just get a wild hair, send us send us a note and just tell us about books you're reading that you love or, or just anything like that. We'd love to hear from you. It's been so much fun to get to know all of you a little bit better. Yeah. As Paul said, it's going to be a little lonely over the next few weeks, not getting a steady stream of email from listeners, but we'll deal with it. We're going to be okay. Yeah. And uh, now I guess let's get back to talking about bookstores. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Well, I'm sure some of our choices that we're going to go through now might lend to some other things that are surprising or that we we like. So are you you good? Do you want to start listing some of our favorite bookstores? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Do you want me to take, do you want to go back and forth? Sure. Well, give me, give me, give me one of them. Okay. Well, I mean, I've been there probably. I already, (laughs) I already talked about Boulder bookstores, so I will just, I'll I'll just touch on that really briefly and then I'll move to another one real fast. But I mean, it is just absolutely wonderful. If anybody gets a chance, I know Francis before we recorded our episode with her, she talked about how she's been there a couple of times and it's one of her very favorite bookstores. There's this on the se- second floor, there's this open air I and mean, it's not open air, but there's uh, these big tall windows that pour this light into it. And mm-hmm. it's just like this big, I don't know how to explain it, but it's just this, it almost seems like a, uh, a religious experience when you walk in there, <laughs> at least for me. And it's just a gorgeous You've room. gone into full. the Holy of Holies. Exactly. That's how I feel. So anyway, I, I won't go on, on, on and on about that one, but if anybody ever gets a chance, go there. But um, one of my very favorite bookstores is in New York and it's Three Lives and Company. Mm-hmm. Um, speaking of just, it's it's not a big space at all. It's a, It's actually a pretty small bookstore. But I remember a friend and I were there and we were in New York and I didn't know specifically much about that bookstore, but we just being the people we are, you know, we're like hitting two or three different bookstores in New York. And I remember it was raining and we had just come from dinner and we were walking through the rain. And then you see three lives bookstore sitting there on the corner looking so cozy and welcoming. And then I open the door and it has the creaky old wooden floors and I start looking around and it's exactly what I was talking about with just the curation in that store might be the best of any I've ever gone to. It's just in a small space. It's like, it was hand chosen for me. It's 
amazing. So yeah, that would be one of my very favorite um, bookstores. It, when I think of New York, you know, that's one of the first places that pops into my mind is Three Lives and Company. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I've been there. Um, again, I remember the small space. Remember, mm-hmm. remember how, how nice that was. Well, I'm going to go to one. I hope you don't think this is cheating too much. <laughs> I'm going to go to one. I actually have not stepped foot in, but I have, I, I always watch videos of people going through it and I follow their page. So I see them wandering around in their bookstore and they mm-hmm. recently moved it from London to Bath. Mm. And that, you, you may already know where I I'm do. going. Yeah, now I know. Persephone Books. Um, I wanted to pick one outside of the US, but when I was in London, I can't remember the bookstores that I went to other than like, you know, Borders or mm-hmm. um, or Waterstones. And I thought, well, of course, you know. So yeah, but did I cheat, Paul? Am I, do you no, need, do you not need at to all. Slap me around a little bit. <laughs> no, nope, I'll I, allow it. I'll allow it. I would say this is one of my favorite bookstores, even though I've never gone into it, just because of what I've seen of it, but also because this is a publisher. They publish mm. gorgeous, gorgeous editions of women authors from, you know, from particularly, I guess, from the last century or so. And, oh, I love their books. I love their taste. I love their aesthetic. I love their bookstore. Mm-hmm. I love that it's now in Bath because now it's not just a London association. There's the whole, you know, Jane Austen or exactly. even Roman association. It just mm-hmm. it just feels so nice and warm, even just like I say, visiting it virtually. And so maybe again, this is more of a bucket list bookstore. I do want to go. I've been there, you know, to Bath in London um, in the past, but it's been a long time. We're certainly going to go again. And I will make a point to visit them. But again, I as I was thinking about it, I was like, I kind of feel like they're already one of my favorites mm-hmm. just because people take pictures, people do videos, people, you know, go make it's like a pilgrimage site. Exactly. And so I'm going to put it on here already. <laughs> no, that's fine. I mean, I, it was actually going to be one that was going to be on if, if we do any kind of bucket list rundown at the end. Absolutely. I agree with you. And I like you. I like that it moved to Bath. I think that makes it even more interesting and unique so yeah it's definitely one that i gotta hit one of these days have you been watching their like pictures in their transition and like here's the space and it doesn't look like a bookstore no uh, or anything yeah you should check that out it's been fun i think maybe a lot of it's on instagram okay Uh, but yeah so it's pretty quick to find and just kind of look at what they're dealing with and Mm -hmm. hear some of their stories and and that's it's very uh, very fun yeah that sounds fun it's always amazing when you see those because I think there was another bookstore I saw that was moving and they did that kind of video of, of the process and seeing a room that just looks like any other room suddenly get turned into this wonderful, magical mm-hmm. place. It, it's it's fascinating to see that happen. Nope, yeah. I agree. What else do you have? Yeah, so my, uh, my next one on the list is another actually fairly small physical space, but it's Faulkner House Books in New Orleans. Hmm. Um, I don't know if you've been there. It's Mm -mm. right. It's tucked away in this little, it's called Pirate's Alley. And it's right over by, I can't remember the name of the church, but it's like that iconic big, I think it's like a 15th or 16th century church that's burned down. I don't know the whole history, but right in New Orleans, right in the big square there, Jackson Square. But this one is kind of tucked away in this little alley on the side. And so you could walk right by it and hardly even notice it, but they have a little a uh, chain outside that has this swinging sign that says Faulkner House Books. And you walk in and it is tight. I mean, it is a <laughs> tiny, tiny little space, but it's just beautiful. The The bookshelves are beautiful. There's like a chandelier in the middle, right in the middle. And the history of it is really cool because it's actually Faulkner lived there in that actual physical space for not very long. And it was pretty early in his career when he was in New Orleans. And he wrote a couple of his early lesser known books there and so that doesn't you know that's not the reason why i love it but it's it makes it interesting it's just Uh kind of a cool place but anyway that's a it's a wonderful little spot there's always just one person sitting at the desk and that's about all that can fit in there is you and that one person and you kind of have to (laughs) edge around and you feel like you're imposing on somebody's home or something but um it's just a really cool place it's new orleans is a great book town anyway and so there's a lot of great jumbled up old dusty used bookstores that are fun to go to, but this place is just pristine. 
and, and gorgeous and really well curated. So yeah, if you ever get a chance, that's a great place to go. Oh, that sounds great. Uh, the last time I was in New Orleans was uh, 1987. Uh-huh. I was pretty young and didn't go to any bookstores. <laughs> right. I wouldn't remember them anyway. I remember going to Jackson Square and all that though. So, mm-hmm. but I do, I, I would like to go back someday and definitely bookstores would be on the, on the list of yeah. places what, to see. Whenever I'm there, um, it's always, yeah, food, food and books. That's pretty <laughs> much how I plan my entire trip. Well, and the best place at Disneyland is the New Orleans section. So, mm-hmm. you know, I, I do visit, you know, periodically. <laughs> That's right. It's the same thing. <laughs> well, the next one that I'm going to talk about is one of my old uh, favorites uh, from when I lived in New Jersey and worked in, in New York. And it's a little bookstore in Montclair called the Wachung Booksellers. And yeah, this is one of those that it was always hard to find parking because it's just on this little narrow street, you know, you to walk up to it and watch out for all the cars. You feel like you're walking in an old part of, you know, some medieval city. Mm-hmm. And when you go in, it's just books, books and books and books and tables of books. And just like you were saying, it, it's kind of hard to get around, um, but in the best way that yeah. you can th- think of, you know. Um, yes, I, I've i been to plenty of bookstores that give you a lot more space. I don't necessarily like that. They feel a little sterile. They feel a little bit like, oh, here's the book section. The rest of this is so that you can, you know, walk out as fast yeah. as you can. And and I like it where they're like, no, you can get trapped in here and you'll be <laughs> <Right>. fine. <laughs> you'll be just fine. Um, but they they have a really good selection of, of books and uh, from from small presses. You know, those are sometimes tough to find even in independent bookstores. Mm-hmm. But these small presses, they, they do a great job of, of just having them there and in stock. I would go there and find a lot of backlisted titles from, you know, New Directions or Archipelago, Godin Press from Boston. You know, they just had them and and others that I'd never heard of. So it was always a treasure to just go and, and see what they had. And I still get their emails. And so it makes me like, oh, you know, I, I miss, right. miss that. But yeah, so the Watchung Booksellers in Montclair, New Jersey, just a beautiful place. Again, beautiful in the fall, especially. So mm. if you're living in that area, go give them a go give them a visit. Yeah, I'm glad you pointed that one out because it's always nice to hear of one that like I was not even aware of them. So mm-hmm. hopefully someday I can make it. Well, they're not too far from the city. Mm-hmm. Far enough that you'll be like leaving the city, of course. But you know, Montclair is a, is a main line from the trains coming out of uh, out of Penn Station and all that. Mm-hmm. So, um, awesome. all right. Well, what's what's another one you've got? Yeah, or did we already one. go three years. I, oh, I, you know me. I could probably we could extend this episode <laughs> to three hours, and I could still be coming up with new ones. No, I mean, just last month I was in Seattle, and hmm. this I've been there twice now. The Elliott Bay Bookstore. Uh, up on the, I think it's called the Hill or I can't remember the section of town, but it's a, a wonderful section with lots of great food and it has a really cool vibe up there. And Elliott Bay is is a great bookstore. It's much larger than the ones that I've been talking about previously, but it still feels very welcoming. It's it's It still feels right. You know, like whatever right is for a bookstore, it has that vibe to it. Um, yeah. What you were saying about a lot of the small presses, because a lot of the independent bookstores that I go to, like you said, they have great selections, but they don't always have a lot of these, you know, we end up on some of these like translated fiction rabbit trails where we'll get off into these, I don't know if they're obscure, but you know, they're not usually on your average bookshelf. And I was walking around Elliott Bay and I think I even sent you a picture Uh Trevor, while I was there. And it's just like, look at the stack of books that they have that I just could not believe that they were all sitting there, like just available. So you know, I had to face, I should have packed another <laughs> suitcase or something, but I made it out there with a relatively, you know, decent stack. Um, could have, could have been twice as big, but yeah, it's a wonderful place. Is, to, is your um, wife uh, listening right now? Because, <laughs> she, uh, <laughs> I know she's going to be like, to keep that secret. No. <laughs> exactly. They're in that hidden wall behind my other bookshelf. No, <laughs> luckily she's long suffering, but very kind about my books. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's a wonderful place. And w- a couple of years ago we had taken our kids up to Vancouver and Seattle. And I will say that Elliott Bay also has a wonderful, um, they were younger then, but they had a wonderful little kid section that's set aside where they have this castle that the kids can climb around in. And, and they have like, you know, little bean bags in there where the kids can take a book in there inside this castle and read and everything. So that's always nice too, when they offer different things like that. So yeah, <laughs> but anyways, yeah, Elliott Bay, it's a wonderful bookstore. 
Well, and and I love Seattle. I haven't been there either in a while. Mm-hmm. A little tangent. Uh, the last time I went was with uh, my my roommate, my good buddy, and it was maybe maybe nine o'clock at night, and we thought we should go see a Mariners game. Mm-hmm. There's one, you know, in in like two days, and so we called up another friend. And said, hey, do you want to go to Seattle? We're leaving right now. We're going to drive through the night. And we did. And at Yakima, my car broke down. Ah. And so we left it in the shop there, jumped on a bus, and then hitchhiked some of the way to get onto Vashon Island where we had some friends staying. That was the real, you know, the reason we knew we could do this trip. Right. And um, left my car. We were kind of abandoned. And I remember walking past that bookstore while we were walking around the city and just exploring Mm -hmm. and things like that. But at the time I didn't go into it because I didn't have anything with me. It was like, you know, really just, just me and a few friends who didn't want to go. But I remember thinking I want to go back. Yeah. And anyway, we did see the Mariners play. Nice. And, um, and then we, we hitched a ride back to Yakima where my car was waiting fixed and drove the rest of the way home. It was like (laughs) just three, three days, you know, the things you could do, even though we probably shouldn't have, you know, back right. in those days when there were no other real obligations going on. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's a good road trip story. But yeah, yeah, next time you're there, you'll have to Next time, make sure. I will be much more responsible to make sure I can get to the bookstore. <laughs> that's, that's right. Get your priorities straight. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, my the, 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 the last one I wanted to mention as far as like a, a, a favorite bookstore is one that you'll have to visit if you ever come this way. It's the King's English in Salt Lake City. And it is a wonderful place. It's it is a very small little building. It almost looks Shakespearean um, on the outside. There are little restaurants around it, and it's you'd love it, Paul, because you go in and there are all these little rooms that you know, like oh, what what's around this corner in this doorway? Is that a staff area? Well, no, it's another room with different uh. books in it, and you, there's a little rocking chair. It's really creaky floors. You know, it just has that sense of we've been here. Mm-hmm. And this is where people come for the solace. You know, it's like, yeah. it's like a church <laughs> in some yeah. ways, you know, and it is that they have a lot of events. They've done really well, I think anyway. And it was started by two authors who just wanted to run a bookstore while they worked on their own books. And they, they got a grant. Let me see if I can figure out who did it. I, I'll check it out. So I'm, I'm looking online just to see if I can remember. And there's an article in the guardian about the King's English. Hmm. So here, I'm going to, can you, can you see that little building? Oh, yeah. Showing you? Yeah, just a really yeah. nice little place. Started in 1977 as a space for two aspiring writers to pen their great American novels. And let's see if I can figure out who gave them their grant now. It's who I thought it was. James Patterson. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, so James Patterson gave them a, a, a grant and they said, we've used the money to literally raise the roof on our children's room, <laughs> put in windows and build more shelving. Uh, raising the roof meant exposing the furnace. So we've turned it into a tree house. It's oh, amazing. Wow. It, it's a, so cool. it's a wonderful place. And uh, I've only been there a few times still. It's up in Salt Lake. It's not that, it's not that far, but I'm always so tired on like Friday nights or Saturdays, but my wife and I, w- w- you know, it, it's kind of one of these places that could be a, a destination. Mm-hmm. Just go to the bookstore and to dinner yeah. and it'll be a lovely night out. So that sounds great. I need to hit that one. That one's not too far from me in Denver. So no, n- no. And if you come, if you, if, you know, if we ever, if we ever do like a, 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 a mooks and gripes podcast tour <laughs> I, there you go i like it we'll boulder bookstore and that yeah one. that'll be fun it'll just be two of us and you know that's we'll, right we'll pop our iphones out to record a bit for for anyone who's interested in listening along but that would be fun <laughs> that would be really fun i love it oh any any others i, I i've lost track of how we were doing this but yeah. it's just been fun to, to talk no, about it has bookstores. been this conversation is kind of like those bookstores we talked about, the, the rambling kind that just go into yeah. different catacombs and rooms. So <laughs> I do have a few more, and I'll just buzz through them really quick. Um, City Lights in San Francisco mm. is one of my favorites. That's my bucket list bookstore. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's it's great. I mean, everybody probably knows. It was founded in 1953. Lawrence Ferlinghetti, who actually just passed away, I think, mm. amazingly within the last year or so. But I've been there a couple times, and it's it's a great – it's another one that the bookstore itself is wonderful, but also just – 
the history surrounding it also makes it kind of one of those destinations that everybody who loves books should go at some point and just see it. And then my last two is just a, another New York City combo. You know, The Strand, I realized that there's been some different, you know, issues or, or controversies around certain things with The Strand. But as far as just the destination to go, I mean, that is just an iconic place. Our our eighth grade son, um, for school, they're talking about a potential trip to, to New York City. And I was thrilled to hear that one of the mm-hmm. places that the teacher said they would go would be The Strand. And I was just like, okay, that's money well spent. So that's really um, cool. <laughs> yeah. But then the other one, and I don't know, you may have actually um, pointed me in the direction of this one. I don't know, but McNally Jackson on mm-hmm. Prince street there. I, I mean, I that... remember you, you writing, you know, I'm, Hey, I'm in this, I'm in New York. Where, where should I go? And I exactly. remember telling you that probably just, others did too, though. No, but just their, their translated book section is mm-hmm. unlike anything I've ever seen before. Not only it, like they'll just, they just have an entire wall and, there'll be an entire shelf just devoted to one country of translated fiction. And it goes on and on for, you know, several different walls. And I've just never been anywhere that has quite that much of a dedicated space. I'm sure there are other places, but I've never been to any bookstore that has that much space dedicated to translated fiction. So yeah. And, and everything about that store, it's, it's a really kind of modern um, clean store, which normally isn't necessarily my aesthetic, but something about that store. Mm -hmm. It's magical. I love that place. So yeah. I could spend obviously years in New York city alone just, and then, you know, so anyway, those are a few more that I really love. Well, I think we recognize this, you know, we are just one person, each of us who's, who have gone to various bookstores. We know we're missing some great ones. Mm -hmm. This is certainly not a conversation of these are the three or four or five best bookstores in the world. So listeners, let us know what your thoughts are. What are we, what should we put on our bucket list? It, it, when we put together our travel guide, you know, the, the right. Nooks and the Gripes uh, <laughs> uh, travel book, what bookstores should be in it and why? I'd love to, love to hear from you. Uh, Paul, any, any other um, bucket list bookstores, things you've heard about that are, you know, you're, you're wanting to one day make the trip? Definitely. I mean, Persephone was on my list when I when I make it across the pond one of these days. <laughs> um, you know, probably the very the very pinnacle of my bucket list would be the Shakespeare and Company in Paris. You know, mm-hmm. just everything about it. Just talk about kind of mecca for book lovers. At least that's the way I view it. I would love to someday go there. Um, Powell's bookstore mm-hmm. in Portland. I've never been. I would love to go there. I have a There's friend a f- who works there. It's where really? Ryan Gallagher from Criterion oh, yeah. Cast works at, at Powell's. So, oh, cool. Um, yeah, just just a place that I, I've never been either. I would love yeah, to go. Yeah, I would love to go. And then a few of these actually are ones that I've, I didn't even know about except through kind of the Twitter um, universe that I've come across. So Brazos Bookstore, where Mark Haber works mm-hmm. down in Texas. I would love to go there. Um, Point Reyes out in California where Stephen Sparks works. I would love to visit that in person sometime. East Bay Booksellers out in Oakland, I've heard really good things about. And then Deep Vellum is, uh-huh. again, another one of those that's a, a bookstore and a publisher. And that, that's down in, I believe it's Dallas. I know it's Texas. Um, it's either Houston or Dallas, but I would love to <laughs> hit that as well. So those are a few that are you know, some some more realistic for a, you know anytime soon. And then some are just someday I'm going to have to go there type things. Yeah. 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 How about you? What are you, what's on your bucket list? Well, I think you named meant most of them actually. Uh-oh, sorry. Let, let me just no, that's fine. I'm not certainly not upset. You know, all the time that I lived in New York and worked there, I never went to the Strand. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I went and visited publishers, you know, I went to various publisher office buildings and met with them and talked with them, sat down with them, and I never went to the Strand. Wow. I don't know why. I knew yeah. about it. And I knew, I think it just, you know, it was always something that was going to be there. And then yeah. we ended up uh, leaving before I ever went. So that's, that's still on my list, but I'll be honest. I don't necessarily look forward to the day returning to New York. I didn't, I didn't leave in like shame or, or feel bad or anything. <laughs> I was just, it was my, my job was so busy yeah, and so kind of, you know, just one of those things where when I finally was able to leave, I thought, oh, this feels wonderful. Look at this world, you know. <laughs> I can see that. I mean, every time I've been there, it's been for three or four days. And as much as I love it and the energy and excitement, I'm tired by the time I leave after even just a few days. So I can't imagine, you know. Yeah. And, it, you know, it's beautiful, especially this time of year. I love taking walks around Central Park. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but yeah, I don't know when I'll be back. Um, 
you know, probably go to London again before I go back to New York. And so looking forward to, to that. And, and when I'm in London, I, there, there, I think several that I, I, I missed out on the first time around, uh, even though we tried to hit bookstores, uh, I'm excited to, to make that a, a better, a better point. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, I think we, I think we talked, I think, you know, you mentioned many of the ones that I would say I would like to go to. And then earlier in the episode, I kind of mentioned the other ones like Birch Bark and Parnassus that yeah. I've never been to. So, yeah. So, yeah. But again, listeners, we'd love to hear from you. What are, what are your, uh, what are your uh, temples and, and churches that, mm-hmm. <laughs> for books that you go to for, for that kind of joy and, and peace and all of that? I want to, I want to know. I want to well, know. I, and I know we have some international listeners. And, and one thing I would love to hear is just of some different bookstores around the world. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, I think sometimes just by the nature of what I know realistically I'll be able to go to, my my lists tend to be a little bit, you know, uh, United States centric. Yeah. But I would love to hear about around the world where there's some different bookstores, too, because that would be something else I would love to do someday is just explore the world, you know, through, as always, food and books, you know, that's a great lens to look at things. So I would welcome that as well. No, that that's a really good point. And, you know, we hear about them whenever I listen to like an author speak and talk about, well, I went to this bookstore in Germany or, mm-hmm. you know, Italy and loved them. And, you know, you see the, their books and I couldn't read most of them, I don't think. But it, sometimes the, going to the bookstore isn't about picking out a book you can read. It's that other experience mm-hmm. of there are the books and look at the care that's been put into um, designing them, stacking them, and presenting them in this in this way that again, there's that invitation to to partake and to engage, even if you can't read the words. You know, again, I get maybe this is a partially partially an episode about the physical book as well, mm-hmm. uh, just because there is you know, if it weren't for that, you know, I don't want to go to a bookstore that looks like an Apple store. Exactly. So <laughs> it's a great way to put it. <laughs> so, yeah. So I could definitely go to bookstores all around the world and still be in awe of, of what they've got, even if it's not in my native language. Mm-hmm. So yes, please. That's great. Great point, Paul. Oh, all right. I've got one little recommendation for, for listening. I don't think we do this as regularly as we maybe did at the beginning of our podcast, but I didn't want to go too far without recommending a film that I just watched and absolutely adored. And that is uh, Johnny Toe's 2004 film Throwdown. <laughs> oh, I don't know anything about this. <laughs> All right. Sounds like I'm recommending, you know, a Jackie Chan movie <laughs> or, you know, some, some martial arts thing from the seventies or, or, or whatnot. And I'm I'm not um, Throwdown. I didn't know anything about it. It just came out in Criterion, and I've heard of Johnny Toe, kind of a very stylistic, you know, frenetic director, Hong Kong based, who, um, you know, is well known by those who who know him mm-hmm. <laughs> and who, who who pay attention. But it hasn't necessarily made a breakthrough to the larger world market or anything like that. Um, at least as big as many of the other ones that we we may have heard of. But so this was my first experience with him and I just popped it in when it arrived. I didn't, I don't even know if I read the back of the, of the the case. I think I just threw it in and thought, Oh, this might be kind of fun. And Paul, I, I was just taken for a ride and didn't know anything that was going on for the first 45 minutes. (laughs) And I did not care one bit. Um, Andy Miller said it perfectly when describing a book not too long ago on, on backlisted pod. He said, this book is so stylish. It gives substance a bad name, (laughs) which I I loved that quote. He's probably butchering it a little bit, but yeah, this was so wonderfully, so deliberately, so joyously stylish that yeah, it gives substance a bad name. But at the time I didn't know what was going on. You know, there's Mm -hmm. like dreamlike sequences, people fighting just to fight, but it's, perfectly captured and it's off enough. They're not just fighting. It's not just like some cameraman catching the beauty of a fight. They're grinning. There's something going on or while they're doing it on the distance, someone will go up on stage and just start singing. It is bizarre, 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 bizarre. And then it starts to 
to come together. And I didn't care that it came together because, again, I was just delighted by the whole ride. But when it did, I was touched. This was like one of the most heartwarming movies I've ever watched. It's not it's not sentimental. And I actually get the sense that Johnny Toe isn't saying, oh, don't worry about it. Things will work out in the end. I get the sense he's saying, don't worry about it. Things aren't going to work out. <laughs> So you've got to to figure out some way to find the joy Mm -hmm. right now. And it was just the way he presented that and the fun that he presented it in. It was, it was just a really great, uh, surprising, weird, um, you know, it took me for a trip and I, I adored every minute of it. I've just been giddy about it ever since I watched it. So there's my recommendation. That sounds great. Yeah. I'll have to go check that out. Is it? Did you say it's on the Criterion Channel? It, it isn't. Or, okay. I looked for it because I wanted to to let people know that they let go go watch it right now. But I, I, it's just available on their physical uh, okay. media right now. Great. Well, but yeah, I'm sold. I'm gonna have to check that one down. That sounds really interesting. It is November right now when this episode's coming out. Ah. There is a Barnes and Noble Criterion sale probably going on because there always has been, you know, for the last decade or more in November, a 50% off sale. So there's a time for people to go in and check out uh, Throwdown. Yeah. Um, I would definitely recommend it. Good idea. So any, it, it, again, we haven't been doing that as much. Did, did, do you have a recommendation you want to leave? I do. I mean, with? mine's going to continue our theme. So just <laughs> yeah. follow Let's bookstores. Get like, Let's get exactly. back. <laughs> no, no, I don't mean to be redundant, but just I've had so much fun following a bunch of these different bookstores on social media partially because of all the great pictures and book recommendations. But also one thing I've really enjoyed during the pandemic and one of, I think the the valuable things that have come out of the pandemic is so many of these bookstores have been hosting these virtual events. Mm. And so I've been able to sit in on some of these conversations, you know, I've been to a lot of book signings or, or chats with an author in here in Colorado. Like I've gone specifically, but obviously, just by the nature of geography and everything else, I haven't been able to go to a lot of ones that I would like to see. And, and this has just been amazing. I've been able to see so many great conversations virtually, you know, through Brazos or Point Reyes or Harvard Bookstore, you know. And and so I would just recommend for people to follow mm-hmm. those bookstores on social media and keep an eye out for these events. And then obviously, once you get, a lot of them are free, but do something that you can buy the book that they're talking about, or at the very least, there's often a way to just donate to the bookstore. Because it's been a rough couple of years for these bookstores and, and they're coming up with these creative solutions to try to make things work. And so I think it's important to not only take advantage of these wonderful opportunities, but to make sure that you support them as well. So, yeah, mm-hmm. that, that's my general recommendation. It's It's been amazing. I cannot believe some of the conversations I've been able to sit in on. I feel privileged to be even in the same you know virtual room with these people. So, yeah, mm-hmm. that, that's my that's my vote. Oh, that's a great recommendation. I remember when the pandemic just was starting. And, you know, I'm working from home. And so they would sometimes start, you know, say 6 p.m. on the East Coast, but it's still, it's only four where I'm at. So I might take a walk mm-hmm. and listen to the conversations while I was out for a walk. And those, yeah, th- that's a wonderful recommendation. And I also like that you pull in, you know, these, the, as they're opening up to more of us, the it might make it even harder for them to, to make the money. I mean, beyond the fact that there's the pandemic going on, but these aren't things where you're, you know, sitting there with a stack of books in front of you that you're like, Oh, I'll just buy this book right now. You know, Mm -hmm. I'm I'm right here. Here it is. I just got excited about it. So yeah, if you can make it a point to have that on your mind as you log out to, to show that support uh, for sure. Again, if you can make sure you're self-sufficient and and can, can do that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you can, that's a great way to keep this culture that we all love going and and show that we love what these places are doing um, because it's it, it just must be an immense amount of work. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, you, you have this picture that you've presented a few times on the podcast of just kind of working in the back of a dusty bookstore. I think that that's, uh, uh, you know, we, we read about that in, in stories. But these are businesses that have oh, yeah. to plan events and and make sure the space is is available and and coordinate with publicists and authors and sometimes difficult people and staff who has to be, you know, polite to patrons and to you know sometimes difficult personalities to make these things come off so well. Yeah. And now they're learning how to do it on technology, 
And mm-hmm. so, yeah, there's there's so much work and thought. I, it's so wonderful. Yeah, that's a great point. I'm glad you mentioned that because I know when I talk about that, it's obviously a very idealized version and it's more of just a, <laughs> For you know, sure. it's more of a dream. But yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the reality because I know so many of the people who work in the bookstores, either the owners or the people that work there, they, they work so hard. And um, I know that it is a full time tough job in a lot of ways. And so, yeah, like you said, any way that you can show them your appreciation, either tell them, but obviously then support them any way you can. Um, yeah. That's a great point. Sorry to crash your dreams, Paul. No, <laughs> no, I, know, I, I realize the reality of it. I know, I, I, I know, it, that... I know that. I know that that <laughs> is not like uh, um, calling you out or like Paul. It's time to come come down to earth because I want that too. And I will often think if I ever get you know super wealthy, you know, yeah, I'll start a bookstore, and then I'm like. Oh man, that might kill me. <laughs> I know. No, I picture more that the, when I picture a bookstore, it's that one from the never ending story where the, the little old crusty guy is like sitting in the back and he's basically chasing customers away. So that's probably closer to the r- truth of it. But. <laughs> there you go. There you go. All right. Well, listeners, thanks so much for your time today. Again, enjoy your November as we enter into, you know, this holiday time, Thanksgiving and, and Christmas and books. You know, that it's always been part of my holiday season and we'd love to love to hear from you as you share yours. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Mooks and the Gripes podcast. You can follow the Mooks and the Gripes and get show notes and book and film reviews at mooksandgripes.com. On Twitter, you can find Trevor at Mooks and Paul at BiblioPaul. You can also get information about future shows on our Patreon. If you'd like to donate to the show, anything and everything, even a dollar a month, helps and is deeply appreciated. You can become a patron at patreon.com slash mooks. Until next time.